Hello, my friends. Hello, and welcome once again to Stately Vaughn Manor, where today I'm going to be talking to you about the 12 classics that you must read. You don't, you don't really have to read them if you don't want to, but I, I was thinking about this. I've been, I've been spending a month where I've been reading fiction that I've really enjoyed for the most part, but it wasn't the most challenging stuff, let's say, in the world. And sometimes after spending a lot of time just reading kind of, you know, fun books that are really enjoyable, but you know, you sometimes want a little bit more, a little bit more of a challenge, maybe some books with some deeper themes, some nuance, stuff like that. You know, sometimes you want a classic. And I was thinking if I were to recommend some classics, but not just classics, these are the classics that, you know what, read these if nothing else. If you don't read any other classics in your life and you're only gonna read a few for whatever reason, read these, at least read these 12. These are the must reads, you know, not that you have to, but these, these are my list of classics that, yeah, you should read these. What are they? Okay, uh, there are 12 of them, and they're not in any particular order. I just got the 12 books and dumped them down here, and we're gonna go through them, although the oldest ones are at the top of the heap here, so we're gonna go through those first. The first one would be the Epic of Gilgamesh. The Epic of Gilgamesh. This book is very, 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 very old. It is one of the oldest known books that has survived on different clay tablets. And this penguin version is really good because it, it puts together all of the surviving uh, tablets. It has little illustrations of the tablets themselves and the text and uh, also some illustrations that came along with the original tablets from that time. Uh, so it's really cool. This is a really cool addition. And I'm not just recommending this because it's really old, but because the themes that the Epic of Gilgamesh talks about are universal. And for a book that's thousands of years old, it's a human story that we can immediately relate to. And this connects us to that distant past just through our very humanity because this asks questions and talks about themes that are as important to us now as they were when this was originally composed so long ago in the past. Themes like friendship and the nature of friendship and death and facing death and how we need to develop the courage to face death. So they're pretty heavy themes in this. Life, death, friendship, love, that kind of thing. All that is in here. And, you know, as well as, you know, monsters and cool stuff like that. There's a lot in here to recommend. And definitely, yeah, the Epic of Gil Gilgamesh. At some point in your life, I would recommend picking this up for sure. So that's that. This next one is also really old, but it's also foundational. This is the Iliad by Homer. This is, like I said, a text that has influenced so much throughout history. And this particular version of the story, translated by Robert Fagels, the Robert Fagels translation of Homer is so beautiful and so well done that I suspect it is going to become a classic in its own right, if it hasn't already. It, it, it might have, actually. This, I think, and I've read a few different translations of Homer. This one, I think, is probably my favorite. I think this is the most accomplished. I'm not going to say that it's the most true to the poem, line for line. But it is a beautiful piece of work, and it brings Homer to you with an immediacy. Uh, the story of the wrath of Achilles during the Trojan War, 
again, a story with a lot of human themes that we can relate to. Uh, yeah, definitely the Iliad by Homer. You need to, you need to read this. The Odyssey is good too. It has a sequel, The Odyssey. But I think out of those two, this is probably the better and more moving epic poem. So yeah, The Iliad by Homer. You should read that. You should read that book. Now we're going to move on to something that's actually a lot of fun. This is a fun book. This is The Penguin Complete Sherlock Holmes, but yeah, The Complete Sherlock Holmes by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. You should read the whole thing. Just get a complete edition and just read it. It's not that long. You know, there aren't that many Sherlock Holmes stories, just enough to fit into this one book. But like I said, it's a lot of fun. It is, again, a very influential book. Every mystery or detective series that came after this was probably touched by it in some way, large or small. But more than just some of the greatest detective stories in all of literature, this is an interesting examination and development of a fascinating character, that character being Sherlock Holmes, who is a very different, very interesting man, who was, who was brilliant and focused his brilliance in an interesting way, the solving of crime. And it also tells the developing story of another great friendship, the friendship between Watson and Sherlock Holmes. These things are developed through the course of these stories and novels that are part of the Sherlock Holmes series. And if you read it all together, you really see that development, the development of Sherlock Holmes' character into where he starts off as kind of this aloof thinking machine. Uh, but through the course of the stories, you see that he actually is a human being. And it's really cool. Sherlock Holmes, you should read that. You must. And then we're going to move on to a whale of a book. I don't have my Penguin edition. That is up at the Rustic Vaughn Lodge. So the only copy I have of Moby Dick is this one. This is the Franklin Library edition. It's really cool. Moby Dick. Yeah, it's an adventure story about a whale, but it's so much more. Now, I hear a lot of talk about Moby Dick lately on the booktube. Not everybody likes this book. Some people are really annoyed by this book, and it's many seeming asides and digressions from the main story of hunting the great white whale, Moby Dick, who bit off Captain Ahab's leg, and Captain Ahab has been really pissed off ever since. And so he's obsessed and needs to find Moby Dick at all costs, even the cost of becoming a worse captain and endangering his crew for his own obsession. But there's a lot more to this book than just that. And actually, a lot of the things that annoy a lot of people about this book, those are the things that make this book great, actually. Because... A lot of those chapters that become that come in between the main storyline chapters, chapters about whaling, chapters about whales, philosophical musings about whales, they actually bring this story alive and give it a sense of realism that it otherwise would not have. You feel like you've been on a whaling vessel after you've read this book because you get so much information about whaling and whales and whaling vessels and what they knew about whales at the time, which is not always completely accurate, but it does put you into this time when this was written. It's fascinating. It's a fascinating book that you can go back to a few times over your lifetime and you will find something different in it. It's one of those books. This is the one of those books that demonstrates why classics are important because they are the type types of books that are so good and so interesting that you can go back to them over and over and find something new in them every time. Moby Dick, you should read that book. It's great. 
Now let's move on to the book that you knew I was going to pull, pull up, and that, of course, is War and Peace, War and Peace. Now, War and Peace is giant, and that scares a lot of people off, although I've said before, if you can read these giant Brandon Sanderson epics or Game of Thrones or any books like that, you can certainly read this. It's less complex than Malazan, although I guess everything is. But it's a fascinating book about war and the effects of war on people's lives. In this case, they are aristocratic families that we're dealing with, although we have a couple of main characters. And it can kind of, it, it shows you the devastating effects of war and also how war can change you as a person and how difficulty and hardship can actually bring out who you really are. If you go through difficulty and hardship, that can focus you as a person and help you see what's really important and give you a, a better understanding of who you are. And I think that happens to some of the characters in this book. A lot of stuff happens in this book. Uh, a lot of philosophy, particularly in the back section, there's a back section in this book that drives everybody crazy. But it's fascinating. It's brilliant. War and Peace. I've heard some people say crazy stuff like it's overrated. It's not. It's amazing. War and Peace, you should read that book. Hey, here's another big book. This is Les Miserables, Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. So this book is very different than War and Peace. It, it focuses on different things. This is a very human story. It's a long one. It's a long story. Another book with many digressions. But, you know, back in the day when they were writing this stuff, that wasn't such a big deal. It's not like you're going to, you know, miss out on your favorite television show or something. You know, big books and long stories had their advantages. And this is a story about courage and hardship and heartbreak and the resilience of the human spirit. Like I said, it's a very human and humane story. Uh, and I think it's just wonderful. Victor Hugo's Les Mis, uh, brilliant, well worth the read, even though it's giant. And be sure to get the giant version. There are, there are versions that are abridged, of course, of a lot of these works. But don't mess with those wimpy abridged versions. You want a challenge, after all, if you're going to the classics. You don't want some easy read. No. So get the real thing, man. Get the real thing. Don't sell yourself short. So here you go. Here's something that's a lot smaller, though. This is Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. Brilliant, brilliant book. For such a wee little thing. This is a small little book. This is the 1818 text. The version we usually see is a version that was revised years later by Mary Shelley. She toned it down, I think, a little bit in the revised version. I like this version that she wrote when she was younger and perhaps less worried about what people would think of her or this story. She couldn't know how successful this story would become. And it has become one of the most successful and influential uh, works in all of literature. Just about everybody has heard of Frankenstein. Not a heck of a lot of people seem to have read the book Frankenstein, and the book is a lot different than any of the films you might have seen. And one of the really interesting things about this book is that there are so many things that this book is about. It's about revenge. It's about responsibility. It's about the limits of human knowledge, and perhaps if some knowledge is forbidden, or at least knowledge that we are not prepared for. Uh, it's, it's about ambition. It's, it's about a lot of things. I mean, this is another one of those books that you can go back to throughout your lifetime. And when you read it, you'll find something different in it. But again, a very human story. The monster in this story is a creature that is sympathetic. It can be a creature that is terrifying. And this monster does terrible things in this story. But... You understand why, at least, that Frankenstein's monster is driven to this. Because Frankenstein, he's not a great guy. And certainly does not live up to his responsibilities. So, Frankenstein, 
I'm always going to recommend Frankenstein. Let me put down this big pile of books I have. Okay, and we'll move on to the rest of these books. Okay. So this book, this next one is kind of a beautiful book. This is Ovid, this is The Metamorphosis, and this is a retelling of Greek and Roman myths into one long poem by, by Ovid, who was a Roman poet who lived in the time of Augustus, got himself into some trouble for some of the stuff he wrote, and was exiled, unfortunately. But this is probably his masterpiece. It's a beautiful version of these stories, these stories which are themselves immortal and have influenced so much in our literature. This is just a wonderful book. And again, I, I think it's one of those books that you can go back to time and time again. I've only read this once, actually. And it's well past time I get back to it. I haven't actually read this edition. This is, I re this is an edition by, that was translated by David Rayburn. Uh, I read a different edition years ago, but look how cool this is. Beautiful. And it's, it's a wonderful book. And I think, you know, it's one of those books that you really have to read at least once, in my opinion. In my opinion. Let's move on to some Charles Dickens. You probably have to read some Charles Dickens at some point in your life. And look, it's Charles Dickens. So I chose Great Expectations out of all of Charles Dickens' books. And it was a tough call because he's written some good stuff, Charles Dickens. I probably chose Great Expectations because I think it's representative of a lot of things that you'll find in Dickens, the eccentric characters that still manage somehow to be human beings and to seem real while you're reading this stuff. Charles Dickens' work. It's a fascinating story of Pip. You are invested in Pip, his ambition and his, well, his great expectations. He wants to be more than he is. And along the way, he makes some mistakes. And things turn out quite differently than he expected. Worse or better? Read the book and find out. But it's it's an excellent book, Great Expectations. A lot of people feel that this is his best work. I'm debating that in my mind. I haven't read all of Charles Dickens' books, so I can't give you an informed opinion on that. But of the ones I've read, this is the one I would, sh I would say, yeah, read this book. Read this book if you've read nothing else of Charles Dickens. This is definitely one you don't want to miss out on. Now we're going to move on to a challenging book. Now, very often this next book is considered or has been considered or at least it has been presented as a romance. It is, it is not that. This is Emily Bronte, Wuthering Heights. This is an amazing book, full of really unpleasant characters. There is, I suppose, romance in this, but it's kind of a selfish romance. The people in this book, man, but the, what this book is actually about is passion. This book is about passion, if nothing else. Violent passion and how destructive that can be. And it's also about a lot of other things. There's a lot of abuse in this book. There's a lot of rage. There's a lot of, well, overall unpleasantness. But it, at the same time, it's beautiful. It's hard to explain. But it blew me away the first time that I read this, Emily Bronte's Wuthering Heights. This is a book you've got to read. If you have preconceptions about this book, this will probably demolish them. Wuthering Heights. This is an amazing book by Emily Bronte. It is an, a great achievement in literature and probably one of the best novels ever written. So yeah, there's that. Wuthering Heights. 
Now let's go to something that isn't that isn't a work of fiction. This is a work of history, a very early work of history. You think I'm going to say Herodotus, aren't you? I'm not. I instead of choosing Herodotus, I'm going to go with Thucydides for this list. Because Thucydides well, he's a much more challenging historian, I think, than Herodotus is. He has, a, he has some very serious things to say about the nature of human beings and how human beings do not change. We are, to a certain extent, predictable because our wants, our needs, our desires are always going to be the same from one generation to the next. No matter how much our technology seems to change, we seem to stay pretty much the same as we were, well, way back 2,000 years ago when Thucydides wrote this book about the Peloponnesian War, the massive war that rocked the Greek world, a civil war within Greece where all of the Greek city-states had to pick sides, either Athens side or Sparta side, and go to war, and this describes in great detail the effects of that war and how that war was fought and how people change during wartime. A lot of that stuff never changes. It's also about the nature of politics and power and how nations are very self-interested and how nations, when they make allies or make decisions, it's always from a point of self-interest. It's interesting stuff, and this has been studied forever, and rightfully so. Thucydides, History of the Peloponnesian War. Yeah, you should read this book. Everybody should probably read this book. I mean, unless you don't want to, but you know what I'm saying. I'm going to finish off with, again, this is, this is a book that's not a penguin, but this is the version that I read of this. This is The Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky. And I think this could be, this could be the greatest novel ever written. It might be. It's certainly the greatest that I've ever read, in my opinion. Um, a lot of themes in this book, a lot of theological themes, a lot, of, a lot about the nature of good and evil, what it means to struggle, to be a good person, how difficult that can be at times. It's about a family, about the worst dad ever and his three children, his three sons. Or was it four sons? And it's also kind of a murder mystery. And it's a lot of other things. It's just a beautifully written, wonderful novel. It has everything you want in a novel and so much more. It's just an incredibly rewarding experience reading this book. Probably one of the most rewarding reading experiences of my life, personally. I just, I found this book amazing. And yeah, I, I think it's the best. It's the best. Your brother's Karamazov. I can't say that this translation is the best translation, but it was awful good. This one is, who does this? Uh, this is by Richard Pevier and Larissa Vlankonsky. Vlankonsky. Yeah, I didn't butcher that name at all. So yeah, the brother's Karamazov. Oh my goodness, I've gone on at length. I'll shut up now. I'll shut up. Okay, guys. I'll see you tomorrow when I talk about stuff that is not classic, like, at all. Okay, guys, I will catch you next time.